Hello, everyone. My name is Anfal Hilu. I'm a last year medical student with Avalon University School of Medicine, and I'll be presenting a topic uh, about septo-optic dysplasia. So septo-optic dysplasia is also called Demore Cyrus syndrome, and it was first described in 1941 by Reeves, who defined the syndrome as dysplasia or hypoplasia of the septum pellucidum in addition to optic nerve abnormalities. Later on in 1970, Hoyt and colleagues redefined what septo-optic dysplasia entails and found that the disease um, almost always had pituitary involvement. So to your right, you see a child with septo-optic dysplasia. As you see, the main presenting feature is ocular abnormalities. So septo-optic dysplasia is theoretically hypothesized to be due to like vascular abnormality or constriction. Uh, during the first trimester, first trimester, first two months of embryogenesis. Uh, constriction of blood flow, as we all know, and uh, of blood flow and nutrients would force the embryo to shunt blood flow to larger areas of the brain. And there would be minimal blood flow to the smaller structures, such as the optic nerve, the eyes, the septum or pituitary, which would cause abnormal growth of these structures. And that is what is hypothesized to be the cause of it. So as uh, septal dysplasia is considered a rare disease, it's estimated to present in one of every 10,000 births or 8.3 per 100,000 live births and it has prevalence equal in both genders. <clears throat> Studies showed that it was found to be associated with young maternal age, maternal bleeding during the first trimester, and or alcohol uh, drug abuse. The disease phenotype is highly variable, ranging from very mild to very severe, depending on how dysplastic the structures are. And although mutations uh, amongst family members with septo-optic dysplasia have been found, 99% uh, of the time, it's usually an isolated uh, sporadic finding. So in order for a diagnosis of septo dysplasia to be made, there has to be a triad of midline defect, uh, pituitary defect, and optic nerve hypoplasia. The triad can be detected through a uh, coronal or axial T1 or T2 MRI. Sometimes they use the flare. Uh, there would be a fundoscopic examination done by an ophthalmologist, and there would need to be like repeat hormonal uh, level testing, even if the initial presentation at birth was normal, because some phenotypes, the hormonal abnormalities come out later during their growth spurt. Um, the hormone levels should be tested because the pituitary gland is affected and hypoplastic. And although some of the, uh, some uh, infants have hypoplasia, some of the, not all of the hormones would be affected at the same time, depending on where exactly the hypoplasia is in the gland, since it, it's not usually symmetric. So just like all uh, rare diseases, a geneticist needs to do a full evaluation, which includes a personal and family history. Common questions asked should be about uh, whether there is consanguinity in the family, um, hearing abnormalities, uh, sensorineural usually developmental delay, congenital anomalies such as cardiac, esophageal atresia, and micropenis. And um, there is also known to be um, behavioral issues, sleep, dis sleep disorders, arrhythmias, excessive appetite, temp temperature instability, and uh, symptoms suggestive, suggestive of hormonal deficiencies such as fatigue, weight loss, weight gain, bradycardia, tachycardia. The most severe type of septal dysplasia is called septo-optic dysplasia plus, 
And this type has the triad in addition to the cortical malformations. So, so I'm gonna present a case of septal dysplasia plus at the end of the presentation. So since I'm presenting a syndrome consisting of three abnormalities in the brain, I found it best to split it up and explain each one in detail. So each of these malformations can happen on their own. So you can have septo, uh, septum pellucidum, hypoplasia on its own, and optic nerve hypoplasia on its own. It would not be septo dysplasia, but just an isolated finding. So unless all of these three were combined together in one person. The septum pellucidum is it's a small, thin, triangular sheet that lives under the corpus callosum and functions to separate the anterior horns of the right and left ventricle. A missing septum is associated with many conditions such as uh, corpus callosum agenesis, holopresent syphily, a low bar, semi low bar, low bar, and midline interhemispheric variant, schizencephaly, and Avid syndrome. Avid syndrome consists of asymmetric uh, ventriculomegaly with interhemispheric cyst combined with the genesis of the corpus callosum. So as you see, most of these are, uh, are involved with the corpus callosum being involved one way or another because it's directly underneath it. An isolated finding of a missing septum pellucidum accounts for two to three per 100,000 cases in the general public. Some cases of hypoplasia are without are asymptom asymptomatic, although, uh, although there was a recent study that was conducted on prisoners hmm. that showed that there was a large uh, amount of prisoners that had some abnormalities in their septum pellucidum without having symptoms other than behavioral disorders or psychopathy. So this is a flare MRI on a normal brain image. On a normal brain, image B, and a brain with a missing septum pellucidum. You can appreciate the, the boxing up here on image A of the septum pellucidum being missing. So there would be inferior, the inferior horns of the frontal, the frontal lobe in, are pointing inferiorly. And there's boxing of the, of the ventricle uh, compared to a normal image down here, which you can see the septum pellucidum and the posterior pituitary. In addition to that, uh, this bright dot right here is a posterior pituitary. Since there is an abnormality up here, you would assume there is there is some kind of movement down here, and that's why the posterior pituitary is somewhat displaced. So the next abnormality found in the in the triad is optic nerve hypoplasia. Optic nerve hypoplasia is usually the first presenting um, abnormality that is found and could be could lead to a diagnosis of septo-optic dysplasia. Due to the associated eye issues that result, which entails nystagmus, which is abnormal movement of the eye, coloboma, which is where there is a mis missing tissue in different parts of the eye, such as the pupil, the lens, or retina, and iridia, which is uh, incomplete iris, microphthalmia, micropornea, glaucoma, uh, cataracts, there's strabismus, and corneal opacification, as well as um, ambilopia, amongst others. Anything can happen to the eye because it's not receiving the nutrients that it needs. So it could be unilateral or bilateral, which actually determines how severe the visual impairment is. Uh, an interesting concept is to know is that a hypoplastic anterior pituitary alongside an absent infundibulum is usually associated with optic nerve. So if you have that, 
you most likely have these two. The optic nerve alongside the posterior eye structures can be visualized with a fundoscope, which is done by an ophthalmologist. And if you look to your right here, you will see that the fundoscopic image shows a small pale optic nerve, yeah. which shows peripapillary atrophy. The peripapillary atrophy is what is referred to as the double ring sign. And that is what optic nerve hypoplasia would show on the scope. So here's an image of a T1 weighted coronal and axial MRI. Uh, if you, as you can see, the optic nerve did not completely de develop in this patient. So this, this MRI is actually taken from a patient with septo optic dysplasia and optic nerve hypoplasia and shows an absent septum and there's a hypoplastic pituitary. So if you can note the inferior pointing frontal horns right here. The last of the triad is pituitary hypoplasia. Pituitary gland, as I like to call it, is the powerhouse of the body. So its main function is maintaining homeostasis. And it does that by releasing many uh, hormones, which are like signals that go to various organs, and uh, that's how they communicate. So imagine if the pituitary gland was hypoplastic and not working properly, and that's what we call pan hypopituitarism, which could happen if there is severe hypoplasia of the pituitary gland. The most common deficiency, however, with the hypoplastic pituitary and septal dysplasia is growth hormone deficiency. If not all hormones are affected, so growth hormone can lead to hypoglycemia, delayed tooth development, a micropenis, low growth, and uh, delayed puberty. And if you look to your bottom right, you're gonna see the this, uh, this somewhat presentation of what uh, shows the different causes and effects of a pituitary gland with reduced function. These are T1 weighted sagittal MRI images of the pituitary gland in stock. So image one shows a normal, normal corpus callosum optic chiasm and uh, posterior pituitary and the pituitary stalk and the Sorry. Note how the post posterior pituitary appears as the brightest spot, it appears as the brightest spot within the cella. So image B shows a patient with a homozygous HESX1 mutation, which is the most severe genetic mutation, and we'll go more into detail about that in the next few slides. So you can clearly visualize the severely hypoplastic corpus callosum up here, the optic chiasm and the anterior pituitary in an empty cell tercica, empty cell. No here the ecotopic, ectopic, uh, posterior pituitary gland. So normally it's supposed to be down here, but it's, it's displaced entirely. And there is no pituitary stalk. Image C is of a sibling with the same mutation, but it varies based on patient to patient. That's why it's highly variable. So they have the same mutations, but they show different um, structures and symptoms. So here you can see the splenium of the corpus callosum, which is. Um, more hypoplastic with a shallow cella, and the posterior pituitary is partially descended. So uh, several etiologies have been postulated to account for sporadic occurrence, uh, such as viral infections, environmental teratogens, and uh, degenerative damage. However, the pre presence 
and uh, the precise etiology of the condition still remains unknown and most likely multifactorial. The Mueller cases are rare, but implicate a genetic defect underlying developmental uh, mechanisms. It can be recessive or dominant, and it's also known to involve three genes, SX1, SOX3, and SOX2. In the past, it was thought that the PAX6 gene was involved. The PAX6 gene activates, uh, is, is an activator, and it's considered a master control of eye development. But later studies found that there was no link between septo-optic dysplasia and specific and the PAX6 gene. SX1 is a member of the paired-like a class of homeobox genes and functions as a transcriptional repressor, or which uh, with repression domains within the N terminal region and the DNA binding homeodomain. It's one of the earliest markers of urine pituitary development, um, and it's expressed during gastrulation, gastrulation in the region known to form the forebrain. SX1 expression. Uh, is restricted to ventral, the ventral diencephalon by day nine, and also in the thickened layer of oral ectoderm, giving rise to Rathke's pouch, which is the primordium of the anterior pituitary. It continues development till day 12 and is undetected by day 13 and a half. So homozygous disruption of SX1 in mice is associated with the, the phenotype uh, a phenotype closely resembling of septo-optic dysplasia. The abnormalities are fully penetrant, although variable, and mutations range from complete absence of midline structures, such as the pituitary, the corpus callosum, and the septum pellucidum, to partial formation. Complete absence of these structures um, revealed a more severe phenotype, causing microcephaly, craniofacial dysplasia, and no sign of the te telencephalic vesicle or the infundibulum, and also absent olfactory lipodes. Heterozygous mutations uh, yield, often yield a mild phenotype leading to growth hormone deficiency with or without Undescend, uh, the undescended posterior pituitary. Although the optic nerve hyoplasia and midline structures abnormalities may also be associated, most, like, most often than not, heterozygous mutations only show growth hormone deficiency. The sex one mutations are rarely to be associated, if at all, uh, with septo-optic dysplasia. It's very rare for them, sorry. For, uh, to, for this mutation to be found. There was probably 10 or 12 patients with this mutation. There were uh, eight, 800 patients were screened with septo-optic dysplasia and hypopituitarism, and they found a mutation of less than 1%. So that's how rare it is for the SX1 gene to be found. Sequence variants have been identified, including a conserved base in a cis-regulating region upstream of HESX1, but it is, it's still up to the debate. The fact that HESX1 mutations are low means the mutations in other known or unknown genes contribute to this syndrome and likely involvement from environmental factors as well have an effect. Uh, SOX2 is the other gene involved. It's a transcription factor, which is it's essential for maintaining pluripotency of the embryonic stem cell. Uh, so SOX2 is of the same subfamily as SOX3 and SOX1. Initial expression is detected at the morula stage and then in the inner cell mass of the blastocyte. After gastrulation, it's restricted to the presumptive neuroectoderm expressing throughout the brain, the CNS and um, sensory black codes, wrinkle arches, gut endoderm, and the tracheoesophagus. 
the homozygous loss of SOX2 would be lethal. Peri implant, it would be peri implantation lethality is what they say. Heterozygous mutations appear normal but show reduction in size and in male fertility. Studies show that a reduction of SOX2 levels below 40% resulted in an ophthalmia, in addition to other eye abnormalities. Uh, studies also indicate that there's a role of SOX2 in urine pituitary involvement. Heterozygous mutations manifested a variable hypopituitary uh, phenotype leading to reduced levels of GH, LH, ACTH, and TSH. So SOX2 encodes a single axon encoding 317 amino acid proteins, and it contains um, an N-terminal domain of unknown function, a DNA binding HMG domain, and a C-terminal transcription activation domain. So there has been a total of 12 heterozygous de novo mutations reported according to a research by Kelberman and Deltani. In 14 patients, there they had anophthalmia or severe microphthalmia in addition to developmental delay, learning difficulties, esophageal atresia, and genital dysmorphia. These uh, de novo mutations included five nonsense, four frame shift, one deletion, and two missing. There was also found to be a loss of function in this area right here, C60, and C3387 up here, and also in Y160X. So these three areas showed a loss of function, complete loss of function. The third gene involved is the SOX3 gene. So the SOX3 is a member of the SOX family transcription factor, and it encodes the SRY-related HMG box. Initially, they were identified on homology to the conserved binding motive of high mobility group HMG class. It presents on mammal, uh, it also presents on mammalian, mammalian sex-determining genes, SRY. It's encoded by a single exon producing a transcript of 1.3 KB. And that's important because that maps the chromosome XQ27. So involvement of this specific gene right here would mean that this, uh, the family, if they had it in multiple people, it would be X-linked. So it would only show in the, the males. Uh, SOX3 protein has a short 66 amino acid and terminal domain of unknown function, 79 amino acid DNA binding HMG domain, and a longer C terminal domain containing four polyalanine stretches shown to be involved in transcriptional activation. Expression of the SOX3 is similar to SOX2 and the CNS brain spinal and spinal cord. There's high levels of expression uh, noted in the ventral diencephalon, including the infundibulum and presumptive hypothalamus. Targeted disruption leads to variable uh, to a variable complex phenotype, which includes craniofacial abnormalities, midline CNS defects, and reduction in size and fertility. Like I said, heterozygous females are mosaic to, due to X inactivation and generally appear normal. Uh, some may display mild craniofacial abnormalities, mild phenotypes, it's variable. SOX3 is not expressed in Rothke's pouch. It's expressed in high levels in the ventral diencephalon, including infundibulum, which provides necessary inductive uh, signals for the anterior pituitary formation. Tandem duplications involving chromosome X is identified in several pedigrees uh, and they would lead to mental retar retardation and hypopituitarism. 
Studies also show that both duplication of XQ27 expression, um, XQ27 expressing SOX3 and loss of function polyalanine expansion are all associated with a similar phenotype due to infundibular hypoplasia, which is critical for normal development of the diencephalon and infundibulum of the anterior vitreous. Okay. And here, this is a, um, an image of show, showing how variable the presentation may be. So uh, the growth hormone deficiency is actually found to be in 62 to 80% of those having uh, bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia, more common in bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia. And development delay uh, is also more common with uh, bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia as well as cerebral palsy. And the most frequent, those are the most frequent neurological associations. Pituitary hormone insufficiencies may develop over time, as I said, which may lead to, to lifelong medical follow-up, meaning patient insufficiencies will not be prominent at birth. And I think that's what a lot of the physicians that are ever faced with this disease should put into mind that even if the infant shows to be normal at birth in terms of development, and so what they still have to follow up with an endocrinologist and a whole team of doctors. So this is the first presenting case of a patient with septoptic dysplasia. It's a one week old newborn that presented to the NICU, born at 35 weeks to a young mother that shows bilateral undescended testes, microphthalmia, nystagmus, microcornea, cataracts, anti optic nerve, hypoplasia, and coloboma. He later developed glaucoma after the cataracts were taken out. So during a cranial MRI, there showed to be complete absence of the septum pellucidum but there was normal pituitary gland and a normal corp corpus callosum. The genetic testing was done for PAC6 gene because back before 15 years ago, PAC6 gene was thought to be associated with septoptic dysplasia, but that's been proven false. This patient was inconclusive for both. So more likely than not, this could be multifactorial cause uh, it can also still be genetic cause, but on different uh, on different genes, maybe the has X one or a gene that hasn't really been studied yet because we don't really have enough information to conclude that it's not genetic. But it was a young mother, and that's what most of the cases the cases were found to be in young maternal age. Case two is of an 11 and a half year old Caucasian Southeast European female with earlier established diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency, diabetes, insipidus, seizure, seizures, mental retardation, optic nerve atrophy, and right ptosis. The girl had short stature and low weight for her age. She had bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia, poor vision, nystagmus, and right eye ocular palsy. EEG revealed epileptic changes. So the MRI showed an empty cell syndrome, partial hypoplasia of the corpus callosum and uh, cobum of the septum pellucidum with diffuse uh, polymicrogria of the left temporal lobe. So this is a septo-optic dysplasia plus syndrome because there is involvement, the cortical involvement. It's more severe. So here's um, a coronal T2 weighted MRI of the girl. It shows absence of the septum pellucidum. Uh, there's flat roof, so absence of septum pellucidum. I know this uh, kind of MRI doesn't really show you the internal structures, but you can appreciate how this is pointing downward and it's kind of boxed. There's a flat uh, roof of the lateral ventricles and um, the loss of normal gyri, gyral architecture of the left temporal lobe. 
There's also a thickened cortex with indistinct cortical medullary interface, uh, also called polymicrogyria, and there's an enlarged sylvian fissure. And these are findings you would only find in septo-optic dysplasia plus because uh, it basically is the most severe type and has involvement of everything. This patient also has an empty cella, so there's hypoplasia of all features in there. So to conclude this presentation, um, I wanted to point out that septoptic dysplasia is a rare syndrome and it may or may not be diagnosed prenatally, even though uh, usually prenatal ultrasound at 20 weeks met, uh, measures the brain structures and everything, this can go undiagnosed and it is in many cases. It is most likely, most often sporadic, and mutations are to, due to the HESX1, SOX2, and SOX3 gene. And to get, to confirm a diagnosis of septo-optic dysplasia, you need the triad. So it's highly variable in nature and, de and de de depends on specific genes that are mutated. Diagnosis requires a need for several specialists and follow-up every three to six months. Septo-optic dysplasia plus affects the cortical development. I think there should be prenatal screening should provide more focus on midline brain structure development. And also there should be further studies that to be conducted to assess the function of the septum pellucidum and its role in human behavior. Any questions? Okay. Can you clear your screen, please? Yeah. Can it be asymptomatic as well? Uh, please can, clear your screen some more so we don't, we can go back to uh, seeing everybody. How do I do that though? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um...